I know that there's a lot of people covering the riots right now. I plan to cover them too, but not this time. The situation is just too volatile, and I don't want to throw gas on the flames. A video about it is coming, though. Executive Order 13925. It's the 161st executive order of the Donald Trump presidency, and it's a doozy. If it stands, that is. Users of social media may not recognize the number, but I'll bet that they recognize the subject. Preventing Online Censorship Online censorship on social media platforms? Grab a cup of coffee, because that's worthy of some roasted opinions. In order to discuss EO 13925, we have to discuss the Communications Decency Act of 1996. Oh, quit groaning. It may get a little dry, but at least I did the research for you. All that you have to do after we cover this is to go verify my sources, and that should make this worth listening to. Just have some coffee while we get through this. The CDA is Title V of Public Law 104-104. I've read it, and it's mostly legislative jargon. Quote, Section 639, 47 U.S.C. 559, is amended by striking not more than $10,000 and inserting under Title 18 United States Code, unquote, and similar language that only makes sense when updating law books. But there's an interesting section, 230, which became 47 U.S.C. 230. Simply put, 230 is the liability section. 230C1 will not hold internet computer service providers or users as publishers of content that others have provided. 230C2 protects the same people from liability if they provide a good faith effort to restrict access or availability of materials that the provider or user considers obscene, lewd, lascivious, filthy, excessively violent, harassing, or otherwise objectionable. Now let's look at these two provisions. The purpose of this act was to make sure that there was some protection for underage internet users against access to websites that post things that are patently adult, like pornography. Now, if I post something online that someone else finds objectionable, neither the platform nor any user will be held liable for what I've posted thanks to 230C1. Individual responsibility is firmly in keeping with the U.S. Constitution, and I approve. 230C2 is protection from civil liability for the platforms and users that are restricting access to content or removing content. You see, somebody who posts content to that website might claim censorship because of their content being restricted or removed by the provider. 230C2 provides protection from civil liability for this potential violation of the First Amendment. Short answer, social media providers can't be sued for removing or restricting content. All that they have to prove is that they were removing or restricting that content in good faith. This provision makes sense, although it's being ignored in a way. You see, social media platforms are removing or limiting content as if they would be held liable for that content, even though much of that content is not obscene, lewd, lascivious, filthy, excessively violent, harassing, or otherwise objectionable by a common law understanding. The providers are often also allowing materials which do meet those standards to remain published without restricting access to that material. They are policing some content and ignoring other content which would violate the same legal definition, instead of either leaving that content alone or removing all of it. But if they are going to police all content deemed to violate these prohibitions, then what content can they police and what content do they have to leave alone? That comes down to the definition of the phrase otherwise objectionable. The platforms are all looking for these materials in order to meet the good faith standard of Section 230C2. But 230C2 doesn't make an absolute definition because it doesn't limit that phrase with any qualifier. Otherwise objectionable is defined by two entities, the provider and the user. Ergo, if the provider wishes to limit content which they consider objectionable, then they're protected from liability for doing so. If a user wishes to report content as objectionable, they are likewise protected from civil liability for doing so. But ultimately, the platforms get to decide what content is objectionable on their platform. 
They can restrict access or remove content based on their terms of service, which constitute the founding part of their good faith efforts. That means that they can edit content just so long as they can justify it as objectionable content via their terms of service. But to whom? That's the real question. Under common law, the standard for what a legal term means is ordinary usage. The legal language means what it would ordinarily mean in the courts unless specifically defined. Otherwise objectionable in this context without specific definition means that if the platform finds it objectionable, then it's objectionable. Section 230 means that a user may report content that they find objectionable without incurring liability for doing so. Users, however, cannot remove content that other users post. That's why there are options like muting and blocking. The platform has the ability to age restrict, remove, or block content for all users. They also have the ability to kick users posting objectionable content off of their platform. <sighs> That's over. Go refill your coffee cup and we'll dig into the rest of this. All of this should sound familiar to you if you are at all familiar with the DMCA and the arguments surrounding it, because roughly the same provisions exist for providers regarding copyright violations. In the DMCA, though, the definitions are much more extensive. Here's the rub, though, with the CDA. If what is objectionable isn't defined, then providers effectively have carte blanche to edit or remove anything from their platforms that they deem objectionable. Providers are therefore also editors, because the courts cannot tell them that something isn't objectionable until what is and isn't objectionable is defined by statute. I hate vague legal terms. Hate them. Anything that's vague can be exploited as a loophole. Without this loophole, providers on social media would either be restrained by specific limitations in the law or give up those protections to be understood as publishers. That's not just my opinion. That's based on court rulings which predate the CDA. Publishers not only have the right to edit every bit of content on their platforms, they also have a legal obligation because if they don't, they can be sued for that content, not just the poster. EO 13925 cites Supreme Court precedent in Packingham v. North Carolina that social media constitutes a digital public square. Therefore, the rules which govern what can and cannot be said and done in the public square also cover what can and cannot be said and done on social media. It also cites 47 U.S.C. 230A, which specifically states that the Internet is supposed to be, quote, a forum for true diversity of political discourse, unquote. Now, this controversy was precipitated by Twitter deciding that they would editorialize President Trump's tweets by placing fact checks and warning labels on the ones that they found objectionable and restricting interactions with those tweets. This is the same kind of behavior they've been engaging in with other users, but the president actually has the authority to do something about it through the EO. The warning labels were in response to earlier rulings by the courts that the president's tweets are public communications and cannot be removed. Trump responded to the labels by issuing EO 13925, and then Twitter fired back by continuing to restrict interactions with the president's tweets and labeling them as offensive, but published, quote, in the public interest, unquote. Now that's interesting, too, because that might represent a contribution in kind to Joe Biden's campaign if they aren't doing the same thing to his tweets. Twitter might argue that they are, but I'd like to see proof that even one of Joe Biden's tweets has been labeled as objectionable by Twitter but published in the public interest, with interactions restricted. If this does represent a contribution, then Twitter might be liable for violating election law regarding in-kind contributions. You see, social media platforms make money from advertising. If Twitter's editorial remarks on Trump's tweets constitute a free ad for Biden, then Twitter as a corporation has made a direct in-kind contribution to the Biden campaign with a value equal to what the Biden campaign would have paid for such advertising. Under election law, corporations can contribute to political action committees, but they cannot contribute directly to campaigns. Trump has since responded by tweeting, quote, repeal section 230, unquote. Now, in my opinion, that's a bad idea because the purpose of that section of the CDA and the similar sections in the DMCA was to make sure that platform providers didn't get sued into oblivion for what their users did with the access provided to them. That would suppress free speech in the digital public square just as much as vague language in Section 230C2 is doing, if not more. Rather than repealing Section 230, Trump needs to allow the EO time to work. 
The EO contains specific limits on providing clarification to the meaning of otherwise objectionable. I say that Section 230 should remain. Just with the loophole closed, the digital public square must remain freely and fairly open to all.